Okay, this is uh, lecture uh, number five. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about alveolar ventilation. It's a very simple lecture. There might be a bit of calculations, but beyond that, it's really straightforward. These are the objectives in, page, in this slide and in the following slide. So please go through them before you start reading the lecture. And uh, start here with the Dalton's law of partial pressure. It says that the partial pressure exerted by individual gases in a mixture of gases is equal to the total partial pressure times the fraction or the percentage of that gas in the mixture. Usually our atmospheric pressure, at least at sea, le at sea level, <coughs> is about 760 millimeters of mercury. Usually this atmospheric pressure goes down when you go to high altitude, and that's why people who climb high mountains may get hypoxia essentially before they acclimatize <coughs> because the partial pressure of oxygen drops. And if you want to calculate the partial pressure, for example, of nitrogen, the percentage of nitrogen is 79%. So if you want to figure out the partial pressure of nitrogen is going to be equal to 760 millimeters of mercury multiplied by the percentage or the concentration, which is 0.79, and that comes to be 600. The same token, if the percentage of oxygen is 21%, to find out the partial pressure of oxygen in atmospheric air, you multiply 0.21 by 76 millimeter of mercury, and it gets to be about 160. This shows you the same. Maybe the percentage is slightly different, but that's irrelevant. It follows the same principle to calculate the partial pressure of a gas in a mixture, whether it's oxygen, CO2, or nitrogen, you take the percentage of that oxygen in the mixture, of that gas in the mixture, and you multiply it by the partial pressure. As you can see, most of the gases which are present in the atmospheric air are oxygen and nitrogen. We have very little CO2 and very little water. <clears throat> That's again, this is just the same slide. Now, I want to ask you this question, or let's say it that way. Once the air gets to the airways and to the alveoli, the alveoli are not dry, they have some water. And the water vapor exerts some pressure and dilute the total partial pressure of gases once they are in the alveoli. So if you want to calculate the partial pressure of gases within the airways, you have to consider this. and in the partial pressure okay, in the airways will be equal to both the water vapor pressure as well as the partial pressure of the dry air. So what you do here, if this is the parametric pressure here or the atmospheric pressure which is equal to 76 in the airways, this total pressure will be equal to the water vapor pressure plus the, the dry gas pressure, which which comes from there. In other words, there will be dilution of the gas or dilution of the partial pressure, if you want to call it. So if you want to calculate the BO2 in the airways after it's humidified, the percentage doesn't change, but you have to subtract the water vapor pressure from the atmospheric pressure. And that's the formula for it. So it, if you do it actually, Instead of having 160, as in the dry air, it's going to be 150. These are the nomenclatures, or uh, when we see A refer to the alveoli, if we see small a, it's ref referred to the arterial blood. P refers usually to pressure. Uh, C refers to the concentration or content. And this usually refer to the gas, the second part. So if you want to read this, it's going to be the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolar air, or alveolar B CO2 partial pressure. If you want to read this, it's going to be <coughs> arterial partial pressure of CO2, or partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood. 
if you replace this one with oxygen, it is going to be partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. Here, if you replace CO2 by O2, it's going to be the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli or alveolar BO2 partial pressure. Now, these are the values. You don't have to memorize them, you know, but you should have an idea about them. But you can see in the expired air, we have mainly oxygen. We have oxygen in high concentration, at high concentration of nitrogen. And then it gets to the alveoli. And here you can see the partial pressure of O2 in the alveoli it does not match the amount of CO2 in the inspired air for two things. First of all, it's humidified and thus it's diluted. And secondly, there is a continuous exchange of O2 between the alveoli and the capillary bed. And there is also mixing of gases that's coming from, you know, different portions of the respiratory system, like from the dead space, and then the gas exchange. So the best we can get in the alveoli is a partial pressure of 100, 105. And this actually will equilibrate with the partial pressure of O2 in the arterial blood. We'll see this when we talk about gas diffusion. Now you can see the CO2 in the expired air is higher because CO2 in the alveoli gets higher than that in the inspired air because CO2 will diffuse from the venous blood, so to speak, to the alveoli, and it reaches about 40 millimeters of mercury. So now it's eliminated here, but doesn't match here, because again here there is some mixing with the, the space air that has basically little content of CO2. The partial pressure of water vapor is equal to, in the expired air, will be equivalent to the partial pressure of water in the alveolar air. Let me just uh, show you this schematic diagram. This really summarizes a lot of things in the lecture. Here is the alveoli here. We take air through inspiration and we eliminate air through expiration. During inspiration, the amount of O2 is high. So when the blood comes to the capillary in the lung, it's going to take the CO2 and give CO2 so that now the arterial blood will have high O2 partial pressure and relatively low CO2 partial pressure. Whereas this guy that's coming to the lung through the pulmonary vein has low partial pressure of O2 and relatively higher BCO2. So <clears throat> we'll talk about this, but the thing is, look at this here. Assume that we are taking 500 ml of air. Now, some of this air does not get to the alveoli, and that does not participate in the gas exchange. And this is equivalent, or the air that fills the conducting airways is known as the anatomical dead space. So we talk about usually about alveolar ventilation and total ventilation. And then we speak about the frequency of respiration, how many breaths or how many times we breathe per minute or how many breaths per minute. And this is how we have two terminologies here. I'll show you how to calculate them in a minute. This is the total ventilation. This is basically you take the total diadal volume, whether it, whether it is involving gas exchange or not. You are just trying to find out how much of the air is getting to the lung, conducting airways and respiratory zone. So if you multiply the tidal volume by the frequency, it's going to be about 7,500 7, ml or 7.5 liter per minute. And now, since this portion of air which remains in the dead space does not participate in gas exchange, it does not participate in ventilation, so the alveolar ventilation will be equal to the frequency of or tidal volume minus the dead space, which becomes about 350, and you multiply it by the frequency, it comes to be about 5 liters per minute. And then if you divide the ventilation over the perfusion,
which is the amount of the blood flow going to the lung per minute it's it's close to one actually it's about 0.8 usually further on the dead space usually i mean you know when we speak about the dead space one may get the conception it is just the amount of the airway the amount of the air that is really going to the conducting zone but this is not quite true because if we want to talk about the physiological dead space it's going to be equal to the anatomical dead space and the alveolar dead space under normal conditions if everything is perfect in the lung every perfect everything is perfect in the pulmonary circulation the alveolar dead space, there is no alveolar dead space because we assume normally all the alveoli part participate in gas exchange, okay? And in this case, the physiological dead space will be equal to the anatomical dead space. However, if you take this diagram right here, it shows you, let's say this is the anatomical dead space. That doesn't change much, actually, depending on the physical buildup of the person, his obesity, his height, etc. But what could change under some conditions, let us say that we breathe, our airways are patent, and everything is fine, our respiratory mechanics is fine, the air will go to this alveolus and to this one. However, assume that for one reason or the other, the blood flow to this lung was impaired, like, you know, somehow it did not get enough blood, as a result of this, the exchange of gases between the alveoli and the blood will be impaired. So this will constitute, if you want to call it a functional dead space, so to speak. Whereas in this alveolus, you can see that it's getting adequate ventilation and adequate perfusion. So if we have one working and the other one is not working, the physiological dead space here will be equal to two components the anatomical dead space and the alveolar dead space which was wasted here because we get there but it's not utilized for gas exchange now this is a schematic diagram to show you that every time we breathe 150 ml remains in the conducting airways or in the dead space so let's that let's say that we have a previous breathing we stopped at expiration we started to inspire again, and we inspired one tidal volume. You can see this is the, tide, the new tidal volume we are breathing. Only the 350 from the new air is getting to the alveoli or to the gas exchange area, and the other 50, 150 will replace the previous portion from the previous breathing, and this guy will go to the alveoli, okay? This is again, this slide just summarizes for you the dead space, anatomical versus physiological, and uh, I just have them for you to read it in case you did not follow up. And let's go to the next slide now to show again what's minute and alveolar ventilation. Minute ventilation is equal to the total amount of air moving in or out of the lung per minute. The respiratory rate is how many times we breathe per minute, like 12, 14, 15. Anatomic dead space is the air that goes to the conducting zone, to the conducting zone and does not participate in gas exchange. We have the physiological dead space, which is equal to the anatomical plus the alveolar dead space. Under normal conditions, usually the physiological dead space is equal to the anatomical dead space. And alveolar ventilation, due to the presence of a dead space, it reflects the air that gets into the alveoli or the respiratory zone where gas exchange takes place. If you want to do it in mathematical terms, uh, to find out or to calculate the minute respiratory volume, you multiply the tidal volume by the respiratory rate. If you want to calculate the alveolar ventilation, you take the tidal volume, subtract from it the dead space, both the anatomical and alveolar, if it's present. So in other words, we take the physiological dead space usually, 
And as I said, if there is no wasting of ventilation, there is no alveolar the space, so this can be replaced by the anatomic the space. And again, we take this value right there and multiply it by the respiratory rate. Said in terms of equations, if you like math, the minute ventilation will be equal to the tidal volume multiplied by the respiratory frequency or breath per minute. And uh, alveolar ventilation will be equal to the following tidal volume minus the, the volume of the dead space multiplied by the respiratory frequency. It's the same, it's just expressed in, in terms of an equation, if you want to call it. Now, we usually click space because there are values available based on sex, age, height, and body weight, and surface area. So they are available in, you know, in the literature. So you don't have to worry about it that much because it's available. You don't have to calculate it or do anything about it. Usually it is estimated that our anatomical dead space about 150 ml. That varies from one person to another though. And uh, a quick formula for calculating the anatomical dead space, you take your weight in kilograms and convert it into pounds because the dead space is usually equal to the person's body weight in pounds rather than kilograms. I think the people who did the studies figured it out in pounds and we have to go with it. So if my weight is 150 pounds, my dead space is going to be 100 50 ml. Now, if you want to measure it anyways, or if you want to do some experiments or whatever it is, the anatomical dead space can be estimated by nitrogen breath test, or uh, this, this test actually sometimes is better than the assumption, especially if we have inadequate ventilation perfusion. Because here, if we have alveolar dead space, then we will end up with underestimating our dead space by our body weight because we are only estimating the anatomical dead space. So the anatomical dead space can be also calculated using the nitrogen breath test. And the nitrogen breath test or Fowler method depends on the fact that when we take air, it has nitrogen and oxygen. It will be distributed in different portions of the lung, and the distribution is not even. Most of the gas will go to the lower portion of the lung, to the base, compared to the apex during to variation in ventilation. And we'll talk about this when we speak about the lecture about ventilation and the perfusion. And, uh, and then the second thing, when you start breathing, you know, certain amount of nitrogen will be present in the expired air. So if we take a sample of the expired air, we will be able to determine the concentration of nitrogen. Now to do this, what we do, here is a person here, is connected to this valve. Through this valve, he will breathe normal air, which contains both oxygen and nitrogen. We will have him breathe a few times to be sure that he is taking uh, oxygen and nitrogen. And then we shut this valve here and we open this valve and we ask him to breathe pure oxygen. Now, pure oxygen will go and it will dilute, in a sense, the nitrogen in the airways, but that's fine. And then after he takes a breath, ox a pure oxygen, we will ask the patient to breathe slowly with time. And then through this nitrogen meter, we will be able to record the nitrogen concentration in the expired air. So let's say that the person take a deep breath to the total lung capacity. He's taking only pure oxygen. And he start expiration right here. Now we are recording the nitrogen concentration in the expired air at different times. This is the beginning of the test, and this is after 10 seconds. So what's going to happen here is that the nitrogen concentration 
is very low initially, then it starts to go up and then it plateaus. At this point, okay, the nitrogen that's coming here will be reflecting the nitrogen concentration in the alveolar air. Whereas early on, you can see the concentration of nitrogen is pretty low. And because we are taking pure oxygen with no nitrogen, most likely this expired air is coming from the dead space. Now, if you plot the nitrogen concentration versus the lung volume, you can see these two points A and B. This vertical line or this portion of the curve right here represent the volume of the dead space. Now, that's it. It doesn't, it looks pretty simple, but I bet it's a bit more complicated. Now, if you do the, if you do the previous experiment where the patient breathed pure oxygen and then the patient started breathing, what's going to happen, you get this type of curve. This is the beginning and then there is rise and the nitrogen concentration, then it reaches a plateau and then it rises a bit again and then it basically they stop the test. And they divide the curve into four phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. You can see during the early phase of exhalation or expiration, the nitrogen concentration is pretty low and it's coming from the dead space because the dead space is the early portion which is going to leave out. And since this, this space was filled with the pure oxygen and no nitrogen, it, it's expected that the nitrogen concentration will be very low. Now the air, after expiring the first portion in the this space, we start to get air from the central portion of the airways. And this is represented by phase two right here. And then this is purely the nitrogen coming from the alveoli. It's phase three. And here after this, you can see there is a little bit of a change in the alveolar concentration of nitrogen ion. And this is believed to be coming from the apex of the lung rather than the base. It's a bit complicated. I don't want you to go through the details of it. Just have an idea about this curve. And sometimes when there is no further increase in the nitrogen concentration right here at this point, we start to speak about the closing volume where there is no air coming from the base of the lung and most of the air will come from the apex. And the closing volume increases in due to age, due to smoking, etc. That shows you the components that the phase 1C the nitrogen is coming from mainly the dead space, and that's the volume of the lung which corresponds to this phase and represents the dead space. This is coming from, you know, the central portion. Okay, right there. And then this guy is coming from the apex, the middle loop, and the base. And the nitrogen which is coming at this phase is coming only in this region in the apex of the lung. Uh, the reason I mention this is because it's mentioned in your book in a more simplified manner. Again, here is the patient is inspiring pure oxygen and he starts breathing out slowly. And then you measure the nitrogen concentration. This is the plateau phase or the alveolar phase. And this early component represents the nitrogen concentration in the dead space and then in your book he made it simple you take this gray area multiply it by uh, the volume of air and then you take the two total area so this portion multiplied by the volume you know, divided by the total area will be equivalent to the dead space i don't want you to memorize this formula don't worry about it and uh, I just gave you an example to apply it for your knowledge, okay? Now, if we want to measure the dead space more accurately, people have developed, Boris, a respiratory physiologist, 
and he is very familiar uh, respiratory physiologist he developed an equation which gives you a better estimate of the the space and he came to without going to the details if you want to calculate the the space through Bohr equation you take the the space volume divided by the tidal volume and this will be equal to the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli and the partial pressure of oxygen of CO2 in the expired air divided by the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli هذا المقام موحد فيها المعادلة إذا فكفكناها ونعملنا rearrangement للإكواجين this might be easy for you to remember uh, the volume of the dead space will be equivalent to the tidal volume multiplied by 1 minus the partial pressure of CO2 in the expired air divided by the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli. Okay, so th this might be much easier for you to remember. Now, the problem with this ex equation mainly is sometimes it is very difficult to sample the alveolar air. And then if we have, for example, mismatch between ventilation and the perfusion and ventilation, <coughs> the amount of CO2 in, 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 in the alveoli as well as in the expired air is going to be diluted. So it's not going to be an accurate measurement of the space in case we have mismatch. This is good enough if we if the, if the physiological dead space is equivalent to the anatomical dead space, meaning that there is no alveolar dead space. However, if there is an alveolar dead space, okay, usually what they did due to these difficulties, and because it is difficult to measure the alveolar BCO2, alveolar CO2, or the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli, and we assume that the alveolar CO2 will, during breathing will, will equilibrate with the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. One can replace this value by the arterial CO2 or the partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood. These are equation, as I said, uh, if we don't have physiological dead space, then our measurement the, will be accurate and the partial pressure of CO2 in the expired air will be equal or reflect the alveolar BCO2. However, uh, if we have physiological dead dis space, there will be a decline in the partial pressure of CO2 both in the alveoli and as well as the partial pressure of CO2 in the expired air. So, and there is also difficulties in measuring the physiological dead space through this method. And that's why the equation has been modified and the alveolar BCO2 has been replaced by uh, the arterial uh, CO2. Okay, so the modified equation Okay, will be instead of using the alveolar BCO2, we replace it by the arterial blood CO2, the partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood minus the partial pressure of CO2 in the expired air divided by the partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood. You can rearrange equa the equation so that it will be equal to the volume of the dead space will be equal to the tidal volume multiplied by 1 minus B expired C, the partial pressure of CO2 in the expired air divided by the partial pressure of, of CO2 in the arterial blood, similar to what I just mentioned. So this is the original equation as you can see and this is the modified equation, NGOF, modif NGOF modified equation you can see that the alveolar CO2 was replaced by
uh, arterial CO2 or partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood. This is just uh, one example. Maybe you can go through it and figure it out. From this equation, you are required to calculate the rate of alveolar ventilation. You are given the breathing rate, and uh, this is the CO2, the expired air, and this is the BCO2 of the arterial blood. So you apply the equation mentioned, and you will be able to figure out the, vent the alveolar ventilation. Now let me show you the relation between the alveolar ventilation and the gases that we are talking about, particularly CO2. If you look at this curve right here, if you increase the alveolar ventilation, you are going to cause a decline in the alveolar CO2 because it will eliminate more CO2. So increasing ventilation will cause a decline in the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli as well as the arterial blood because at the end of the day they will they will equilibrate and if you hypoventilate okay the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli will increase so let's say this is a normal ventilation here we operate at this point where the partial pressure of CO2 is about 40 millimeter if you have the ventilation in a sense the partial pressure of CO2 jumps to almost twice. So if it was 40, it's going to be about 80. Now this C graph also shows the relation between alveolar CO2 this time and alveolar ventilation. With increasing ventilation, you tend to increase the amount of O2 in the lung, and thus the alveolar O2 will increase similarly but you can see if, if usually the BO2 of the arterial blood is about, of the, of the alveolar blood is about 100, 105. This goes up, but it does not, or the change in the alveolar CO2 and arterial CO2 do increase or decrease depending on the ventilation, but there's more significant drop with the partial pressure at lower ventilation to compare to the increase during higher ventilation. Now this graph shows you the alveolar ventilation and changes in alveolar oxygen tension or alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. Let's say this is our normal value 100-110. To maintain this value we usually breathe around five liters per minute or our alveolar ventilation is about five liters per minute. Now if we hypoventilate the partial pressure of oxygen declines and if we hyperventilate the partial pressure of oxygen. This is assuming at rest and at rest if you remember if you want to calculate the amount of O2 that is needed under resting condition it's about 250 ml of oxygen per minute. So in other words, our body tissues utilizes about 250 ml of oxygen per minute, okay? And of course, the BO2 is determined by two things in the alveoli, by the diffusion between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary, as well as the rate of ventilation or the amount of air that is getting to the alveoli through alveolar ventilation. Now, if you increase the metabolic rate, okay, and you, instead of using or needing 100, 250 ml of oxygen, let's say that you start exercising, okay, then the metabolic demand for oxygen will increase. So the only way to maintain adequate amount of oxygen in the alveoli and thus in the blood is to increase the rate of ventilation. It's to increase the rate of ventilation, okay? So as you can see, if we increase the demand of oxygen and we stay at the same rate of ventilation, we are, we are gonna end up with hypoxia. So the only way to keep up with the demand of, with the higher demands of oxygen is to increase the rate of ventilation. And actually, we can increase the rate of ventilation
dramatically during exercise. Now, the increase in the rate of ventilation and during exercise is not called hyperventilation. It's known as exercise hyperpenia. And now you can see then, to summarize, under normal conditions, hyperventilation, okay, above needs, will increase the partial pressure of O2 in the alveoli, whereas hypoventilation, hypoventilation will decrease the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, and this will end up with hypoxia, and that's what it is. Now, this graph shows you the same thing. However, this one, he combines both arterial CO2 and alveolar CO2 because I said both the alveolar O2 and alveolar CO2 are related. If you change one, you are going to change the other. So this is the normal condition where we are producing 200 ml of carbon dioxide. This is hypoventilation, hyperventilation, and this is hypoventilation, okay? And this is apparently when we increase the metabolic demands. Now, similar to what we mentioned about CO2, let's see what's the relation of partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolar air and the rate of ventilation. This is the normal operating point. We usually uh, produce 200 ml under, of CO2 under normal condition. And if we, the rate of ventilation is five liters per minute, the alveolar ventilation, then the partial pressure of oxygen remains to be about 40 millimeters of mercury right here. If you hypoventilate for one reason or the other, and you still metabolize, your body is using the metabolize for energy, the CO2 will, if you hyperventilate, then the CO2, more CO2 is eliminated compared to what produced, and you will have hypocapnia. If you hypoventilate and you are still producing similar amount of carbon dioxide, you are gonna end up with increasing the partial pressure of CO2 in either in the alveoli or arterial blood. So you will get here hypercapnia and possibly hypoxia. So hyperventilation beyond metabolic, O2 demands result in a drop in arterial and alveolar CO2. So we have hypocabinia. Hypoventilation uh, below needs will release the arterial CO2 or hypercabinia. Now to relate the, the rate of alveolar ventilation to the partial pressure of CO2 either in the blood or in the alveoli, and the amount of CO2 produced here, there is this equation which is known as the alveolar ventilation equation. What this equation says here is that the rate of ventilation is gonna affect the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli and in the arterial blood, and it is inversely proportional. And that just has been shown in the previous slide. If you increase the ventilation, this partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli or in the blood is gonna decline and vice versa. And this is the VCO2. If you increase the VCO2 to maintain adequate or normal partial pressure of CO2, you have to increase the rate of ventilation. And this is a constant, and this constant is related to the partial pressure of gases, so to speak, at body temperature and uh, ambient temperature. So you have to correct basically for the volume of gas that is produced here to correct for temperature and the pressure. Because this does, this was, or this, uh, this equation assumes initially that we are breathing at uh, atmospheric pressure and uh, temperature less than the temperature of the body weight. So you have to correct for temperature and uh, pressure differences when you breathe at room temperature. This slide basically shows you the same thing. Uh, 
and uh, shows you the relation between the alveolar BCO2 or the arterial BCO2 and the alveolar ventilation. As you can see, if you hypoventilate, if you hypoventilate right there, the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli is going to go up and will have hypercapnia. If you have hyperventilate, then the CO2 partial pressure in the alveoli is going to go down, assuming that we are producing the same amount of uh, CO2. Now, uh, this shows you the relation again during exercise to maintain the adequate level or to maintain constant partial pressure of the CO2 in the alveoli around 40, you have uh, to hyperventilate. So that's what happened during exercise. We, high, we, we increase the rate of breathing, and I said this is usually referred to as exercise hyperpenia. Now, as you can see from the curve here, if we are breathing normally, if our alveolar ventilation is about five liters, if you make this about half, okay, the partial pressure of CO2 will go from like 40 millimeters of mercury to 80. In other words, if the ventilation is halved, then the BCO2 is going to double. And if the ventilation is doubled, then the BCO2 is going to go up. It's going to decrease by half. In other words, look, if this is the normal ventilation here, 5 liters per minute, okay, if we hypoventilate, then the BCO2 is going to go up. If we hyperventilate, if we hyperventilate, if we go up from 5 liters per minute to 10 liters per minute, you can see that the CO2 is going to be going to 20, which is half of the original value, which is 40, under normal breathing. Now, I have this graph again. I just talked about it. The reason I have it, we described an equation that relates the alveolar ventilation to the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli. Now, just to remind you that there is another equation where we can determine the alveolar O2. And this equation depends really on determining the alveolar O2 in uh, alveolar CO2, as shown in the next slide. So the alveolar gas equation predicts the alveolar BO2 based on alveolar BCO2. And remember, the BCO2 and the CO2 in the alveoli are related to ventilation. So the equation states that the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is equal to the fractional concentration of O2, or the partial pressure of O2 in the inspired air, PiO2, partial pressure of O2 in the inspired air, and PaCO2, the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli, and this is the respiratory quotient here. So, and the respiratory exchange ratio is usually the CO2 produ produced divided by O2 consumed. Usually this is about 200 and this is about 250. So the RQ when we eat mixed diet is about 0.8. And again, since the alveolar O2, CO2 will equilibrate eventually with arterial CO2, this value can be replaced by arterial CO2. And the reason for this, again, it is very hard to, you know, to sample the alveolar CO2. So if you want to go to the details of calculation, this is the partial pressure of O2. If you want to calculate it in the alveoli, it's going to be equal to, this value is equal to the partial pressure of oxygen in the, in the inspired air, okay? And remember, to do this, we take the fractional concentration or the percentage of O2 in the atmospheric air, and we multiply it by the atmospheric pressure, and we have to subtract from it the water vapor pressure, the water vapor pressure right here. 
which is going to be about 47 millimeter of mercury and assuming this about 760 so the partial pressure of inspired air will be equal to 0.21 percent multiplied by uh, 713 okay and again as i said this value the partial pressure of alveolar co2 could be replaced by the partial pressure of the CO2 in the arterial blood, okay? And I will give you some examples to use this, to use this equation. This is an example. If you have uh, a person breathing from a gas tank, now you can see now here the fractional concentration of oxygen declines or less than what it, it's more than what it is. Initially, we start Usually we breathe 0.21 oxygen here. We are breathing 0.45%. What's the alveolar BO2? Assuming that the arterial BCO2 is 40 and the RQ is 0.8, and you have to figure out the answer will become about 270, and that's the solution of the problem. That's how you calculate the fractional concentration. It's going to be after humidification. And then we multiply the percentage by 713. And so the partial pressure of oxygen in the inspired air becomes 320. And applying the alveolar gas equation, you will figure out, you apply it, and the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolar air comes to be 270. Okay, this is another example. Please go through it and try to see what you can do about it. So I give you that problem followed by the answer. But I encourage you to read the problem here and try to apply what you have learned in terms of alveolar gas equation and alveolar ventilation equation. This is the solution here. Okay, that's the Bohr equation in a sense to calculate the dead space. And then after finding the dead space, you will be able to figure out the alveolar ventilation. And this is about the percentage. You just go back to the tidal volume and you calculate the physiological dead space using Bohr, uh, Bohr equation. And then uh, you can figure out the percentage of the physiological dead space with respect to the alveolar ventilation, the tidal volume, as well as the percentage of the physiological dead space to the tidal volume. You can see the dead space here is about 25% of the tidal volume. That's another, another problem here. This, this is designed for you to apply basically the alveolar gas ex equation to figure out the partial pressure of O2 in the alveoli using the alveolar gas equation.